Welcome to the FA Football Forum. This podcast episode was from a series delivered back in 2020 to help support grassroots clubs and leagues. This was delivered on a webinar platform and therefore may not make too much sense unless you've got the documentation to hand, all of which is available within the description below. With this being delivered during lockdown, sometimes the audio quality may differ. Please bear that in mind. But as always, if you've got any questions or you've got any inquiries in particular to this episode or any other episode, please reach out to us by emailing clubsprogram at the fa.com. So, who is this uh, individual talking to yourselves this evening? My name is Daniel Warnes. I am National Club Services Manager here at the Football Association. Um, and I have been leading this series of webinars from when we very first started back in February. So kind of now into May, it seems a long time ago where we first began these types of opportunities to connect, um, educate and upskill the amazing kind of volunteers that we have within our grassroots community. And we've done a few, uh, as I've mentioned, I'm not going to go into them uh, all on this slide but i will certainly reference them on the next slide if for whatever reason you're only joining us for the first time this evening welcome um but where have you been and <laughs> more importantly um but if you haven't been able to catch us um, on our previous webinars please do drop the club's program at the fa.com and email and i can share all relevant content with you so what relevant content could i potentially share um we have covered the topics around visions and values. So um, what do we what do we stand for? So what do you guys stand for as a club, a league, an organisation? We've looked at how do you find, define success um, at your club or league, a business continuity plan, how to use marketing to build for the future and how to use social media effectively. So if you haven't caught, caught up on any of them or you would like the recording or content, please do drop clubs program at the fa.com and email. So I'm just going to go back one slide. Just a bit of formal housekeeping for those that have been on those webinars I've just mentioned. Apologies because nothing changes on this slide. Um, hopefully I've covered everything. One thing I haven't covered um, on that list so far is that you are all muted. We ask that you kind of store your questions to the end. Just allows the presenters this evening to keep the flow of the content going. Um, I'll be monitoring the chat. So if there is anything immediate that you'd like um, answered, I will do my best to do so. Um, and if it is for the experts kind of leading the session this evening, we'll obviously hold fire and ask those guys at the end. So if you didn't join us last week, here are just a few top tips from the previous webinar. Um, they'll certainly be reiterated in today's webinar as well. Um, and I will uh, leave you a few seconds just to look at what the top tips were from the previous webinar, which was all around kind of how you use social media effectively, um, which is going to be very important in today's session. So everything that Charlotte, who is our club consultant and is leading the webinar this evening, um, discusses obviously is all within the FA guidelines. So we'd certainly suggest that any top tips you take away from this evening, um, any kind of quick wins that you'd like to go and explore with your club or league, please do ensure that whatever you do and whatever you implement away from this evening is all still in line with our FA guidelines around safeguarding. So as you can see on the screen there, there are multiple different guidance notes from running websites and social media platforms all the way to staying safe in the digital world. And there's been two recent updates as well, especially where we find ourselves using these type of platforms more often um, than we normally would. So there's certainly been some updates to just reflect the current climate we're in. These can all be found on the fa.com forward slash safeguarding. So please do check them out and they will be sent to you along with this slide deck and the recording after the webinar. So these are the four three key things that we're going to cover this evening um, how marketing can support a development plan how to use marketing tools to aid growth of your organization and how to use marketing to aid sustainability and participation now it's not going to be myself leading the content this evening um, charlotte who has been with us for the last two weeks is, is here again i'm pleased to say for a third week running um, hopefully we can keep it four out of four charlotte and get you in next week for um, our final webinar so charlotte um 
it is all over to you. Do you want to uh, unmute yourself and look to um, discuss the topic this evening? Yeah, thank you, Danielle. Yeah, third time. Um, good evening, everyone, and thank you for joining us um, for the latest in the series of marketing webinars from the EFA, especially on such a glorious evening. It's great to have your company. And for those of you who haven't tuned in before, my name is Charlotte Richardson, and I am leading on our third marketing seminar, building upon the sessions that we have had over the past few weeks, but also bringing you some content that is standalone and will, and will make sense over the next 90 minutes. And as Danielle touched upon, our first webinar discussed how to use marketing to build for the future. And in that, we explored and explained some of the introductory principles of marketing and the tools for organizations like yours have at your disposal. And then last Wednesday, we went into more detail around the specifics of social media and how the platform can help clubs and leagues and help save volunteers time and in both of those webinars we were really lucky to have some guests on with us to showcase the best practice and provide some really practical slides of how my advice can be put into action so like danielle says if you haven't been able to catch any of them please do drop her an email because um hopefully you'll find them useful and reinforcing of the key messages of this evening's webinar too so over the next 90 minutes we will be looking into how marketing can support growth and sustain participation which is arguably one of the biggest challenges us grassroots volunteers face it's probably going to be our most practical focus webinar as we're going to be exploring the ways in which marketing can support development plans that you a might already have in place b are currently working on or c aspire to use um this lockdown time to write your very first development plan. But before we get going, a little bit about me. Um, I'm a chartered marketeer who's been involved with the game for as long as I can remember, really. Um, I never reached my incredibly limited playing potential, but my passion for football is something that's never really been in doubt. From watching games with my dad from the age of three to volunteering in a variety of roles, um, as Danielle said, I most recently joined um, the FA as a club consultant, which is a really wonderful opportunity to work closely with clubs, supporting them in various ways. And what I really love about the webinars that we've been doing over the last few weeks is rather than helping maybe a handful that are here based in Kent where I am, um, it's, it's been fantastic to meet so many of you from across the country and answer your questions and lend you some support. So like most of you, I've spent countless hours volunteering in football and still do. In terms of my career, I've been fortunate enough to um, work for a number of years, including um, some fast, fantastic years at a county FA, at a professional EFL club, and within the non-league pyramid across men's, women's, and youth football. So what I'm really hoping to do is use my experience to help show you um, the real depths of marketing and how it can provide a beneficial dimension to your organization, whether you're dialed in this evening on behalf of a team, a club, a league or some other form of grassroots organization. And I'd quickly like to repeat a point I've mentioned at the start of each webinar so far. So apologies to those of you who have heard this before, but it's really important for me to stress. I'm aware that we've had some really great numbers for these marketing webinars, which in turn means we've attracted a diverse range of volunteers and organizations. As in past weeks, I'm conscious that we've got a blend of grassroots, semi-professional and professional organizations tuned in. So I've endeavoured to make each slide as broadly relevant as I can, including examples from a mixture of places across our football pyramid, which will hopefully resonate with you. Danielle, if I could have the next slide, please. What I do know um, will truly resonate and inspire a lot of you is the journey that Faversham Strike Force has been on. And we're really fortunate enough to have Lee Souter as our guest this evening. Now, Lee has volunteered at Strike Force for a number of years and been instrumental in driving their growth and development over the seasons. Lee's going to introduce himself properly later on and share some best practice whilst also providing you with some examples of what this evening's advice looks like in real life. So if we move on to the next slide, how marketing can support a development plan. Now, I'm fully aware that for the football workforce, marketing can sometimes be a bit of a forgotten player. With so many different tasks and roles needing to be fulfilled, marketing can sometimes understandably get overlooked. But the first tip I'd like to give when it comes to using marketing to support a development plan is that with the right amount of resource, focus and teamwork, when marketing and communications is done right, it provides solutions rather than challenges solutions that can help bring your development plan to life, enable engaging your stakeholders more effectively, increasing your success rate and cultivating culture 
to ensure your organisation can flourish and sustain itself. And I think what's pertinent about this webinar is the fact we're delivering it during the COVID-19 crisis. The impact of this pandemic has affected every industry, every sector, and pretty much every element of our day-to-day -day living. Football is no exception. And whilst it may seem trivial and trite in comparison to the wider impact of the pandemic, we do have obligations to ensure we do the best we can to sustain the grassroots game. We all know how key it is to our social fabric and communities. And I'm sure many of you tuned in this evening would have had to shelve plans and timelines you've put in place as we all eagerly await updates to see how scientific decisions will loosen measures so we can begin to build the future. And those plans and timelines might um, have fitted into a document on the screen at the moment, which is the FA template around a development plan. And I've also been working on a marketing template, which will be circulated after this webinar to again, help you take the practicalities and the content of this um, webinar and put it into practice. And whilst we are in unsettling times for the football community and beyond, it does offer us a period to pause and reflect to do some planning and to look at best practice and ways we can embed it into our own methods. One lesson I hope we all take away by the end of this is that with effective marketing under planning, all of this planning and development as a football organisation, your visions and objectives are more likely to be achieved. Now, what I want to do first of all is run through some of the benefits marketing can give you, your organisation and your development planning. So firstly, it can help maintain your focus. As a volunteer, you're often busy and have many tasks commanding your attention, from sorting out affiliations, player sign-ups, to allocating training sessions and organising referees. The list is endless. However, by developing a marketing plan, it does actually allow you to take a productive step back and look at the structure of what you do. You not only get to analyse and truly understand your message as a football club or league, but also learn how to target larger and specific pools of potential stakeholders. Last week, I spoke about the importance of SMART objectives, something I'm sure most of you are already familiar with. But by devising marketing SMART objectives that are linked to your club or league document, you will have a clearer focus. And that lends nicely onto meeting the necessities of your target markets. Now, a target market is a term we use in marketing to describe a particular group of consumers at which a product or a service is aimed. And this, of course, applies to football, the service we offer to our local community and beyond. For example, a charter standard club might have included an aim within its development plan to set up a walking football team. Utilising the focus that I just spoke about, clubs and leagues can be far more specific about the target market they're looking to appeal to. So imagine a walking football offer tailored specifically for men over the age of 65. You can utilise market research to find out what time of day walking football sessions would be most popular for this specific group, rather than guess. You can advertise with greater clarity on channels you think will be most effective. With a refined understanding of the needs of your target market, you'll drive more successful take-up, subsequently boosting participation. And moving on to the next slide, it will also um, help you understand your USP. Now, USP is another key marketing term and it stands for a unique selling point. And included on this slide are some photos from Margate Football Club, who um, I started work for three seasons ago. And part of that was a complete sort of rebrand and overhaul to really plant the football club in the heart of the community to boost participation, improve engagement, um, attract crowds and a whole host of other sort of marketing objectives as well. Now, to be savvy, we have to accept that as much as we love our team, our club or league, we have to do a certain amount of selling to broaden its appeal, to aid growth and ensure long-term sustainability. And developing a brand is a fundamental aspect of marketing because it enables you to help people understand why your club or league is better to that of a competitor and why they should consider affiliating or signing up with you. Crafting a comprehensive marketing plan will enable you to realise what makes you stand out so that you can outline or design a clear strategy to communicate those merits, which is something I know Strikeforce have done really, really well. And marketing will also help you see and create new opportunities. So if we move on to the next slide, um, it's perhaps a common theme for, for football organisations, especially those who are volunteer led, 
potentially overlook the benefits of market research when devising plans for the season or coordinating player opportunities. To ensure your club or league is creating a plan that will aid growth and ensure sustainability, it's vital to amass research and information on the requirements, opportunities and behaviours of those within your local community. The FA, your local county FA, county sports partners, Sport England and various local and national charities will have research you can dip into. So, for example, if you're looking to target women and girls, um, Women in Sport is a charity that has lots and lots of research and specific documents on how you can market to women. And on the slide here um, is an example from Margate. Now, in terms of sustainability, obviously, for some of you tuned in this evening, you'll know all about the sort of pressures of generating income. So our research within the local community showed that there was a real allegiance and understanding that our non-league football club was a huge part of that community. And by being engaged with the community, we found out that the band, the Libertines, were um, opening up a bar in the local area. So through that connection, we were able to put a proposal together to get them to sponsor the front of our shirt. And as you can see there, it's a huge success. The shirt sales were absolutely phenomenal, which means that we generated enough income to really help us certainly go um, sustain through this difficult period but beyond and of course it massively massively helped the reach of our brand you can see some screenshots there of social media posts and the font's a little bit too small but there are social media posts there from germany um, from south korea from china and more locally as well groups of people that were coming to our games for the first time purely because of that link that we really established within the local community but don't forget as well that there are a number of things that you can do on a much smaller level so questionnaires that can be filled out at AGMs and other large-scale events, surveys you can do via email, and even more simply, um, make use of the poll functions on your social media, because these are great devices, again, to help you see and create those new opportunities. And on that note, of course, um, marketing is so important when it comes to building your brand. By ensuring that marketing plays an underpinning role in your development plans and operations, all your activities and outputs will align more clearly to your vision and mission. The benefit of this means both become clearer to your internal and external stakeholders. And this is where a brand really begins to build, as Lee will demonstrate at Strikeforce, because they've done it so well over the years. It's a secondary benefit of embracing marketing and justifies the reason to take a more structured and considered approach to marketing whenever you can. Now, of course, whilst there are loads of benefits of marketing and how it can support a development plan, there are, of course, some challenges. And I want to outline a couple whilst suggesting a few ways in which they can be nullified. Now, firstly, it can be difficult to generate momentum. I personally believe that devoting and dedicating time to a marketing plan can be a fundamental in propelling the growth of teams, clubs, leagues in any football organisation. And Danielle, if I can have the next slide, please. Um, one big challenge is being able to generate that momentum. So, for example, you may have a really fantastic core of coaches ready and able to set up and run an under-18s club um, with your setup. But there are no assurances you'll be able to get up and running instantly or that one or two posts on Facebook will now the player recruitment for you. So to assist with this, I'll refer back to a key message I emphasised in previous webinars, and that is consistency in communication to create recognition. For sustainable growth, you need good tailored content and messaging which appeals to your target markets. Most importantly, you really need consistency to that communication. That doesn't mean creating tons of content, but it certainly means making a commitment to try to communicate more crisply and consistently. To help with this, planning is, of course, really important. If you have a marketing plan that supports your development objectives, you can nail down some commitments to aid your growth. Now, whether this is X amount of social media posts per week, X amount of email updates, or X number of articles in the local paper, planning is key, and there are lots of scheduling tools out there to help you be more consistent without having to spend hours attached to your device. Most website content management systems will also allow you to schedule articles, and there are plenty of social media management tools, including Hootsuite and TweetDeck, which do the same. And MailChimp even has a schedule function, so all of these combined will help you save hours over the season. And it can be really hard to gain support. 
one of the challenges I've come across many times as both a volunteer and professional marketeer in football is that it can be a challenge to get people's buy-in, especially those who don't necessarily have an understanding of marketing and as such either feel a bit intimidated by it or are dismissive of it. I've encountered individuals, clubs and leagues who dismiss marketing, maybe entirely, but certainly as a priority. Components like safeguarding and finances are quite rightly considered non-negotiables when it comes to running a grassroots organisation. With marketing, it seems a little harder to sell that prioritisation. I've come across those who consider marketing to simply mean having a website up and running. And while social media is a bit of a tick box, yet we have Facebook, we have Twitter, we're doing social media well. And certainly, as with anything, you may sometimes come up against restrictive forces who don't understand the value of marketing and why you should be making it a bit more of a priority. In the first webinar, I advised all of you tuned in to bring forward a simple measure. Introduce marketing and communications as an agenda item at committee or team meetings. Incorporating it into some part of your governance gives it more precedence. It gives you a platform to communicate its strengths to people, to provide an empowering platform to feedback success stories, and as we'll come on to later, justify and showcase a return of investment, both financial and time specific. I for one have found it extremely useful to have those opportunities to speak and present such cases in meetings. It certainly helps to engage those volunteering within this department of your club, and it also enables others to understand and engage with it too. We all can make mistakes. One thing I encourage those who ask me for marketing advice to do is to be creative and have fun. And I like to think whilst it's quite simple, it's good advice. It certainly enhances engagement. It makes people want to contribute and volunteer their time. And as such, it can have a massive impact on improving your marketing output. But in the process, we all do make mistakes. Our tone or timing might be a bit poorly judged on a social media post, or we may confidently implement a campaign that didn't quite deliver the results we wanted. I think the thing to, to stress now is that it might well happen. Some content you put out will be more popular than others. The odd mistake may happen. Warren from the Bolton Berry and District Football League mentioned last week the example when one of the league's volunteers posted an announcement the evening before it was due to go out. This can happen, but as long as you're open to learning from any faux pas, as with anything, it will help you grow better in the future. How many times have we all forgiven a player for a mistake that's cost us points? We have to apply the same empathy off the pitch too. You'll be stronger and a much more attractive football organisation because of it. I'd of course want to offer advice to be able to negate mistakes, and that is putting evaluation and controls in place. Produce reports for committee meetings to reflect on your organisation's data and analytics. It will assist you in marshalling your faults, identifying what worked well and what didn't work so well. You can begin to reduce the workload by removing the stuff that's not contributing to your development plan and invest more time and maybe even some budget in the marketing that you know is delivering towards your objectives. And cost. Money doesn't grow on trees, um, especially so for grassroots football organisations. We have a duty to account for every penny and outgoing. Implementing successful marketing strategies can take up time, effort, resource and money. And for some, spending money on marketing might not be a priority or something you can get buy-in for, whether it's from the chairman, the committee or club treasurer. In recent years, there have been funding opportunities that actively encourage and ring fence financial resource for clubs and leagues to utilise for marketing purposes. For example, the hugely successful World Cups programme was linked to the FA's objective to double participation and it was implemented nationwide. Why was it so successful? Well, in my opinion, because pockets of clubs and organisations were empowered by the FA with some specific budget to use with the specific purpose of increasing participation. And it's something Danielle and I were talking about in preparation for this evening. I think actually sidelining and ring fencing that um, budget for marketing is so important because sometimes when we're a grassroots organisation and we get such funding, our instant desire is to kind of cash it in for, for cones and bibs, et cetera. But if you don't do the recruitment and you don't do the marketing, what's the point of buying all those bibs and cones? You've got to not forget the importance of that process of attracting people 
um, when you're looking to grow and develop the participation opportunities at your organisation. So of course it's a challenge for you to sometimes get financial back in and budget isn't set to support your organisation's development plan. I advise a couple of things. The point I've made from the start is that make sure your marketing plans are part of your club or league development plans. A separate marketing plan that doesn't reflect the overall objectives of your organisation or one that devises its own separate aims and targets which jar against those that your club or league is familiar with it's going to, of course, raise eyebrows. Putting together a marketing plan, including smart objectives integrated with those included in your club or league development plan, means you're presenting something that can have a direct positive impact. Secondly, make the most of those free analytics and stats we've spoken about in recent weeks. The data is absolutely golden because it illustrates your marketing performance. And I'll go on to this in a bit more detail later because I think it can prove really useful to you. And finally, it highlights your weaknesses. One of the best things about marketing is it offers the opportunity for you to think big about your football organisation. It allows you to visualise both the short and long term goals. It enables you to drive the vision and enjoy the process of getting there, challenges included. And when marketing is done thoughtfully, it takes into consideration lots of things your target markets, your internal and external stakeholders, and much more besides. Over the past couple of marketing webinars, we've spoken about the players, supporters, volunteers, sponsors, county FAs, committees, and so on. The number of things we take into consideration is huge, and included in that must be an honest assessment of ourselves. This sometimes means some challenging observations around the weaknesses in your organisation. Now, my antidote for this is acceptance. Don't accept the fact that there are irretrievable weaknesses, of course, but accept that you've identified them and begun a process for improvement. I've spoken of this before, but one of the things that never fails to impress me about volunteer coaches is the ingrained culture for improvement. Now, I know Lee, who's going to speak to us later on, is an FA qualified coach and tutors hundreds of people making their steps on the coaching ladder, which is maybe why inadvertently his club, Strike Force, is so good as an ever evolving organisation. But some of the best coaches are the ones who seek to improve. They identify areas of their coaching delivery they want to refine and take up courses, sign up to webinars to aid their continuous development. I think this is so admirable and it's always struck me as one of the most impressive and distinguishable reasons why the Football Association is so universally admired by other governing bodies in sport and co colleagues from abroad because of the help and resource it gives individuals and groups to do just that, to get better. But relating this point to marketing, the fact you're logged on this evening shows a commitment to improve. Embrace that both as an individual and a club, league or academy. There are so many resources online. If you stumble upon something you don't understand or identify a platform you think might aid your club but are unsure, do your research and ask others. If I can move on a couple of slides, please, Danielle. And the next one, please. Thank you. So in the past two webinars, I spent quite a lot of time outlining the different types of marketing tools that can be used to help a football club build for the future and dedicated 90 minutes around social media alone, because I know it's especially a um, powerful tool for the grassroots football community. So I'm not going to go over old ground, but I'd strongly advise if you have the time to catch up on the previous webinars, please do, as they're going to add some further evidence and contextualise the pointers I give now. So to add growth, the key fundamentals, in my opinion, are to attract, appeal and acknowledge. So what do I mean by this? If I can have the next slide, thank you. No matter the size of your team, your club or organisation, finding new members and supporters relies upon presenting your organisation well to the outside world. Fortunately, we live in a time and age where the internet provides us with many low-cost promotion tools to help us stand out. So firstly, making sure you have an up-to-date, purpose-built and mobile-friendly website is key. Your website should be the epicentre of your strategy, as it will be the first stop for any information seekers, be it new fans, new players or members of the local community. Things you can do that don't cost you any money but will increase the chances of your website in being successful and helping you grow include ensuring content is up-to-date, using imagery and video to showcase your club, adding Google Analytics to track the performances of your pages, 
and using this form of monitoring to find out what pages and content works best and letting that inform your strategy. Secondly, being present on social media. Social networks are great because pretty much all of them are free to use and they're highly accessible. Social media platforms allow you to create connection and share important news and updates. One key tip that is if you, um, sorry, one key tip is that you don't have to be present on all social networks. In fact, you probably shouldn't be unless you have the resources to take care of all platforms properly. A good idea is to concentrate on one and really master it before slowly branching out and expanding. Part of your selling point will be your geographical location. And location-based marketing is one of the next big things. And I think it's gonna to prove to be a really important tool, especially for grassroots sports organizations over the next few years. I'd recommend using Foursquare or Google Business, which are services that help people to find businesses nearby to tag themselves in different places and leave comments and images related to them. Now, since sport clubs are the definition of local, it's a good idea to register yours on this platform. And once you've done this, encourage engagement with your players, supporters and stakeholders, asking them to check in at your games and events, share their own content, leave reviews and so on. Creating a digital word of mouth helps you both attract and appeal to new people. So, on the topic of appeal, I believe this slightly differs from attract. Attracting people to your club or league um, to help it grow is based upon the aesthetic. It's all about the brand quality, reach and standing out with unique selling points. Appealing to people aids you because it turns prospects into conversions. It basically turns someone from seeing your tweets on their um, newsfeed to actually actively making a decision to click on and find out more about you. It's really that sort of transition from filling in a registration form or affiliation form or deciding to follow you on social media. And some of the tips I'd help to give you on this would include building an email newsletter. Providers like MailChimp allow you to easily set up and manage professional email newsletters including list management, email template builders, and more. Email is a great tool to keep players, fans, and volunteers informed about upcoming events, games, and everything else going on. And for those of you perhaps in steps two to three, looking to satisfy a uh, supporter base, this can be really helpful in keeping season ticket holders and the most loyal segment of your base happy by sending them bonus material, thank you notes, exclusive content, discount codes and other things to make them feel appreciated. I'd also advise adding a pop-up to your website, a friendly welcome and a call to action to sign up to your e-newsletter for visitors to find out more about you. This is a good way of appealing to users because if you think about your own internet usage, do you give out your email address freely? Probably not. An opt-in is a valuable indicator of interest and provides an opportunity to land directly into the mailbox of a potential new blood to join your organisation. With MailChimp, you can even set up automatic welcome messages to new signups. So just think of all the content and signposting this could do for your organisation. We all know how important and valuable a first impression is. But don't forget the power of offline promotion too. I love digital marketing, I think it's brilliant and it can really get you some great results. But not everything is done online, and especially when it comes to appealing to people to help your club grow, real life promotion can raise awareness of your organisation. Whether you're able to attend local events, set up stalls at relevant community-led occasions, this is really worth doing too. And taking it back further to more traditional marketing tools, posters and flyers still have powerful effectiveness, even in our digital age. Free services like Canva, and I spell that C-A-N-V-A, -A, make it easy to design professional looking posters and flyers. A practical example that might relate to you is if you have a special event coming up, or you want, well, in the future I mean, um, or if you want to co um, coordinate your digital content with something more physical to recruit new players and create new teams, this is a good option to help you appeal to a mass market. Local businesses and supermarkets often have allocated spaces to share such messages. And by doing so, you could even create some openings to engage some sponsors en route. I speak about connecting the traditional marketing with the digital, especially for big campaigns. 
So I'd also advise if you invest in some printed marketing materials, add a QR code as this can easily be scanned with any smartphone device and direct traffic to your website. So if I move on to my final A, acknowledge. The third and final stage is really all about stakeholder engagement. You've done the hard work in devising the strategy to attract and appeal. But there's a massive amount that can be done to aid your organization's sustainability through the artistry of acknowledgement. I'm a great believer in the power of the word of mouth, and I think it's probably still the best marketing tool at any club or league's disposal. Most of you on the call already have a powerful network of friends, families, and acquaintances of your club, your team, or your league members. This network is so powerful because it's made up of people you or others know personally who are often happy to lend support. It can be as simple as asking players, members or volunteers to retweet or share your posts on their personal pages. Reviews are another powerful tool for growth. Invite your network to post them up and make sure in turn you acknowledge them with thanks and gratitude. It's all good for getting those brand values out there. Getting your stories into local radio, newspapers and magazines is reliant on building and nurturing relationships. Local journalists are constantly looking for news stories and material. If you're able to put together a well-written press release backed up with some good imagery and maybe some video content, your chances of getting featured are high. And again, I reiterate to acknowledge when it's happened. For example, if you're under eights of one at the weekend and it's picked up by the local paper, Share that on your social channels, tag the paper in your tweet and link the article on their website. It's all part of the cycle of good publicity and good PR, which is what this whole acknowledge section is really all about when it comes to growing and sustaining your football organisation. One thing I think is especially important for the grassroots game to have a successful and sustainable existence is for it to be rooted in its local community. In the business world, it's called corporate social responsibility. And often clubs and leagues like our own are grateful recipients of checks written out by such schemes. But to be positioned to continue this for the long term, it's important to be active and look after your local community. As we've witnessed in a number of poignant ways over the past few months during the COVID-19 crisis, make sure your club has the community at its heart and you step away from the pitch every now and then. Whether doing a local litter pit one weekend or visiting a local hospital, or participating in a fundraising initiative. This will help you win off the pitch, which is just as important um, as winning on it when it comes to growing and sustaining participation. And I do passionately believe in the altruistic value of doing such things in the community, but I wouldn't be doing a very good job as a marketeer if I didn't also advise that when you do engage in such activities, make sure to wear your kit, your training gear or anything to showcase the uniformity of your brand. If I could have the next slide, please, Danielle. So how can all of this and all these marketing tools and activities aid sustainability and participation? Now, I promised I'd return to the topic of ROI, return of investment, and now seems like a good opportunity to do that. Because whilst it's brilliant to get all these marketing tools and activities up and running to aid the growth of your organization, the key thing is to make sure this growth turns into sustainability. This means your organisation not only ticks all the aims and objectives and development plans, but importantly, is able to operate in a fit-for-purpose scale and manner. And this is, of course, a challenge. It's something that has to be a part of your culture as an organisation. It's one underpinned by return of investment, monitoring and tracking. This is one of the most essential ingredients of marketing, and one I think I can help grassroots organisations increase their chances of growing and sustaining participation. Because ultimately, the question we have to ask ourselves is, does what we do pay off? I'll refer to an analogy I've used once or twice before of a, a football coach. Um, a football coach will assess the strengths and weaknesses of players within their squad. These kinds of assessments go into the decision making process about who and what to deploy to get the best result on a match day. When the full-term movement blows, it won't stop there. A coach, or at least a good coach, will reflect on how those 90 minutes went, what worked well, what contributed to success, or in some cases, what didn't go so well, what caused a negative impact. A really good coach will invite others to comment, will engage in dialogue, 
and move forwards to be a better each and every single match. I don't think the principle and purpose of marketing is too dissimilar to this, and I encourage you to assess how well your ideas and hard work have performed, how the hard work has contributed to your development plan, how it's aided you to reach your objectives and targets. And if you have allocated some budget, then taking a look at what you've generated as a result. Whilst ROI refers to the amount of money you generate after making an investment in something, I'd like to take the principles to advise you to incorporate performance targets to assess your marketing too. If I can have the next slide, please, Danielle. Many marketing strategies don't require much monetary investment, but if we stick to ROI for a moment, for those of you looking to explore financially investing in marketing to help grow and sustain participation at your football organisation, then understanding ROI is of paramount importance. You've been entrusted with funds on behalf of your organisation, so you need to track that money and know how much it has contributed to the objectives and outcomes. Understanding and monitoring ROI means you won't throw money into marketing strategies or advertising opportunities that don't help you. Understanding ROI and tracking it has so many benefits. Not only does it help you from spending money unwisely, it also helps you identify potential opportunities. For example, you may spend £100 on a player recruitment push on Facebook ads. You track the campaign over several weeks and discover that leads from Facebook ads was around about 250 whilst your target was £1 per player sign up. That's a good return for your target and an indication that Facebook is a good platform to focus on. But of course, there are lots of channels out there, so one tip, whether you have budget or not, is to identify the best marketing channels to showcase your USP. If I can have the next slide, please, Danielle. These are some screenshots of different um, platforms for analytics. We've got a screenshot there of Twitter, some from Instagram, others from Facebook. Test them out and see if you generate good results and then try others. You'll gradually rule out certain channels and discover others. And one final piece of best practice that ties in with the suggestion to produce frequent marketing reports is to hold yourself accountable to every marketing channel you target. If you're promoting a new women's league and you're using Instagram to attract teens, check, is it generating leads? Are you noticing an increase in website traffic? How many times has that recruitment page been visited? Have email inquiries been boosted? If not, can you tweak your approach to improve on performance? And that might not mean switching marketing tools. It might mean refining your usage. So if I can have the next slide, please, and focus on this idea of um, your email marketing. Again, this idea of monitoring and amending what you're doing is part of the craft of marketing. So let's say, for instance, that your club email marketing campaigns are suffering from low open and click-through rates. You're sending the emails, you're spending time to draw the content together, making it as interesting and as engaging as possible. But it's getting um, put in the trash can or it's getting ignored. You could stop emailing your prospects altogether, but what a waste of hard work and the mailing list you've worked so hard to cultivate. With some monitoring, the answer will probably show itself within your approach. To improve open and click-through rates, you could simply adjust your subject lines, include more internal links to your website, provide more value in the form of actionable content, offer discounts and coupon codes, and host contests. These amends might boost your email marketing performance and make it a productive channel for your marketing efforts. Ultimately, it is relatively easy to track your marketing performance and figure out which of your marketing channels are most effective. And by doing this, you'll be on track to make sure your marketing activity is helping to support growth and sustain participation at your organisation. Whether money is involved or not, the free tracking tools you have on each and every marketing tool, from Google Analytics on your website to figures on Facebook, to a specific QR code on the flyer drop you do in the local area. To witness true success, always assess and amend your marketing activity based on the numbers at your disposal. Now, it gives me great pleasure to pass on to Lee Suter from Fabish and Strikeforce, who has put together some fantastic slides and some fantastic evidence of what good marketing activity looks like 
when helping football organisations to grow and flourish. So with no further ado, I will pass on to Lee. Hello everyone, uh, Danielle, can you hear me? Yeah, Lee, all good. Awesome, thank you. Thank you, Charlotte, for that comprehensive uh, look into social media. Um, I'm Lee, i am uh, been involved with football for volunteering at Fathers and Strifles for 17 years. I'm not going to bore you with a long introduction about what I've done and what I haven't done. All I would say is 17 years ago when I started volunteering, I had a full head of hair and now I do not. So I know the pitfalls that you go through volunteering in the game. I know the hours that you give and the challenges you face. Um, so we are grateful from an FA point of view and thank you for all your time to give. Um, hopefully my presentation is going to give you some insight into what we do. It works for us. Um, hopefully you'll find one or two gems that you'll be able to use yourself or it might just confirm that you are on the right track. Um, before everyone logs off, I would say I'm not a qualified marketeer. Uh, I've not done any formal qualifications or anything like that. I am self-made through being pushed into the position like many of us are through a volunteer football club. So um, hopefully you'll pick up some bits that I've learned along the way and how it might help you, you guys. Um, we're a relatively average size club. We've got 25 teams, predominantly youth teams from under sevens through to senior, men's and ladies, wildcats in there, and mini bolt section, which I'll come to in a bit, uh, through to vets uh, sessions, walking football sessions, just play sessions. So there'll be a number of clubs that are bigger than us. There'll be some clubs that are very similar to us or smaller with aspirations to get to our side. Um, we've got 457 playing members at the moment and 91 volunteers uh, and we're an FA Charter Standard community club, community club and I think we've been that for about 10 years now so we're really proud of Chart Standard just like uh, lots of you guys. Thank you Danielle. Uh, the challenge we face around social media is we're not Man United, we don't have a new kit coming out every year, we don't have training tops for sale uh, in terms of that Paul Pogba is going to put on and everyone's going to want to buy it we don't have a new £50 million signing coming through the door that everyone's going to be interested in. We are a charter standard club based in Faversham. We don't have lots of content every day, every hour of the day to fulfil our social media needs. But we try and make the best of what we have available to us. And I've touched on that in a bit. Another challenge we face, especially in uh, the early days. So we've been on Twitter for about eight years. Uh, Facebook, six years, social media for about two, one and a half, two years. We had a very concerned committee right at the start, that, rightly so, and they're there to challenge us, aren't they, committees, and make sure we're doing what's right for the club and right for our stakeholders. The, um, they were concerned that, one, we might breach some sort of safeguarding, we might breach uh, standard code of rules in terms of saying something that we shouldn't on social media, we might get into a, a war of words with a parent, an opposition, or one of our coaches, or a player or a parent goes on and slags another club off. So rightly so, um, they were concerned about that. But in these seven or eight years we've been on Twitter and Facebook and Instagram, etc., we haven't had anything like that touch wood. So it, we have had a safe forum at the moment, but we understand their concerns. We also lack resources. We haven't got a budget for marketing. I have to beg, borrow and steal because as Charlotte rightly pointed out, the first pe thing people think of when it comes to a football club's budget is pitches, facilities, balls, bibs and cones. So we don't have the resources, but I'm gonna hopefully show you some of the uh, hacks that we've used and resources that we've got free of charge that might help you. In terms of help, um, Volunteer workforce at football clubs and leagues is very much stretched, so I understand that. So getting people on board to help you with social media on top of what we're probably already asking them to do, on top of everything they've got going on in their life, is difficult. So I understand that volunteering is a massive challenge. And last but not least is understanding what's going on. So we've got 25 teams. Understanding what's going on with the under sevens and what's going on in the senior men's team is difficult. So putting in some sort of communication tool, such as uh, regular emails or WhatsApp groups may alleviate that challenge. Thank you, Daniel. 
So what I'd like you to do is just why I talk about this slide, it's really important to think about what your focus is, like Charlotte said. So think about three things you want your customers to think of and see when they think of your football club or league. What are the three things that a parent, a player, a new volunteer, when they see your football club, what do they want to see? So you might just jot them down. You might go away and have a think because if you can narrow it down to that three words or three paragraph or three sentences, then that's really applicable um, to your audience. So the three for us is fun. Second is friends, and then it comes to learning. So we talk about quite a lot on our social media accounts about it being a fun, friendly learning environment. Now, the reason we come up with them, the reason we use them as a selling tool on our social media is put your shoes, uh, put your feet in the shoes of a parent. Now, I've got two boys. Um, if I'm looking to take them to any club or anywhere, look, are they going to have fun? Are they possibly going to meet new people and expand their social network? And are they going to learn something? And if it ticks all three, and maybe not in different orders, depending on your um, focus as a club or focus as a parent, but if you can get those correct and exactly what your key selling point is, and I talk about them being customers. Look, we're talking about parents. Uh, if you're looking to recruit elite players, then your customers are elite players for example. So come up with why do people want to join your club? Why do they want to uh, give up time to be in your environment? And as it's fun, friendly and learning, I bet there are loads of trust and clubs. They're not too far away from that. But just think about what are your key selling points? Why might someone come to you? Thank you, Daniel. Okay, so our road to success, where we found success, um, understanding the platforms. So we're, as I've already said, we're on Twitter, we're on Facebook and Instagram. We don't get lots of interaction. So don't get annoyed or fed up or disheartened if you don't get 100 likes on every post, if people don't retweet, if, if a post just flies by and no one interacts. Don't worry about that. Just understand that the whole point of social media is about being present. It's about that opportunity that you might get one bite on a post such as you might get a parent just looking at the right time who's looking for a football club who's just moved into the area it's also important to understand what them platforms offer so we find that twitter is very much uh, interacting with leagues clubs and maybe businesses facebook is very much mum book so mums dads parents nans and granddads it's very much about them uh, feeling like they're part of the club, sharing images of uh, their son, daughter, granddaughter, celebrating their success as individuals. They love that. They love, love tagging other parents in as well. And Instagram, we find that that's been really good at sharing what the club is about with our young players. So you can have an Instagram account, I believe you have to be 13. So 13 up, we've had lots of engagement with players. Now that's not through uh, direct messaging, we don't allow that. We follow the safeguarding rules, GDPR and everything like that. We follow that um, to the book. But it just allows them players to be able to see that they are part of something bigger than just their team. They're under 13s, 14s, 15s, 16s, etc. There's something bigger that they're going on and there's more opportunities to that, be it volunteering, refereeing, uh, events coming up that their parents might not engage with, but they might go to their parents and say, look, I've seen this, I want to be involved. With it. So understanding your platforms is crucial and which ones are, are best for you. Data collection has been huge for us. We use a system called JotForm. It's just like a survey monkey. We just use that, it collects the data. Um, so we get everyone's email address from a parent. We get them to sign up to safeguarding, codes of conduct and GDPR. Uh, we also ask them, have they got a skill or trade that they're willing to share with us? And um, so that allows us to gather information on who might be able to offer something when there's a leak in the roof. Is there a roofer? Or more importantly, around this subject, is there someone with an expertise around marketing or press liaison? Um, not just solely on the back of social media, but I would say it's been our success. We've seen a 16% increase in the last 14 months in terms of our membership. So that's been huge through data collection. 
So now we have over 450 emails. So they get our e-newsletter that goes out once a month. And whenever we need it to go out, if there's important topics. Um, in terms of a life hacks, I'll come to that in a bit. There's a few bits that I need to know. If you're a qualified marketing uh, designer or you know your way around Photoshop and that, you're going to roll your eyes um, when I show you what I use because I don't have the qualifications and I don't have the resources. But if you're not, if you don't have them resources, you don't have them qualifications, I will hopefully share with you what I do around that. And in terms of road to success, the lack of help, what I said earlier about getting volunteers on board. Now, through that data collection, I've been able to find um, someone who's an expert in uh, doing e-newsletters. So she does that for us. And we found someone who's um, press, chief press liaison for uh, the House of Commons. So that's huge for us um, in terms of now uh, Richard, whose son is in the club, he does all our match reports. So on a Sunday evening, he puts out to everyone and goes, look, who's got a match report? He collates them, he liaises with the press. We've had the best coverage we've ever had in the last two years. We've had back page spreads of the under sevens first games through to volunteers winning awards, which is great for us because um, it just gets our name out there and keeps it public. And we're dominating local uh, sports sections of the local media, which is great for us being that we're not um, professional background. Um, in terms of uh, deciding what you stand for, we um, comes back to them three points of fun, friendly and learning and just live that through your social media all the time. That has got to be the key message. So look, there's a picture of Matt there. We put that up when we're talking about looking for volunteers or it's Sunday where it's our biggest um, our biggest push in terms of uh, we have the most activity in terms of our mini bulbs and our wildcats, etc. So that is a huge success. I've just seen a question come up. I'm sorry I couldn't catch who it was from, but what, who we use the data collection. Um, we've integrated Google Sheets. So when job form is completed, all that data goes through to Google Sheets. And uh, it's just like an online Excel if you're not aware of that. So that's free again, both are free resources. Thank you, Daniel. So coming back to deciding what you stand for, um, put yourself in the shoes of someone that doesn't know anything about football in the area. They're not a sporty mum or dad, they've moved into the area, son or daughter's gone to school, gets a feel for football, wants to join a local football club. They look at us and see 25 teams, 450 members and think, oh my gosh, where does uh, my son or daughter fit into this? So it's important that with the really early age groups where you see a massive increase in new membership because you're starting from scratch and you're pushing and feeding the bottom of your club, it's really important to understand that, like, how can you rebrand that or how can you attract um, parents to your club over another year R or year one um, feeder group that's coming through. So about four or five years ago, we decided to rebrand our year R's and year ones to be called mini bowls. So um, we have the lightning strikes in our logo, so it makes sense. We went with mini bolts. But if we've got three teams come through under sevens last year that's going into four. We've got three teams coming through, um, even with the COVID situation coming through from wherever football starts. So we've seen a huge increase because parents can see it and go, right, I know my son or daughter is a mini bowl. I know what the coaches look like there. I know they're always on the 3G. When anyone um, mentions mini bolts, they always know where to direct me. They know exactly where to go. So think about how you rebrand sections of your club, a bit like what the FA did with Wildcats. Everyone knows in football, Wildcats is girls, 5 to 11, turn up and play session. Our mini bolts is very similar within a localised area. Everyone knows if you're in year R or year one, you want to play football, the mini bolts is there. It's really key to understand what parents want to see as well online. So um, we've got on Saturdays and Sundays, we hand out certificates. So player of the week or player of the match and um, they get certificates that we've had designed. They're all related to our values around hard work, respectful, friendly, all that that we all aspire to. This gets the most amount of interest. Because mums or dads and underground love sharing pictures of their son or daughter on social media. 
they share it with friends who share it with their friends and it's continuously so we get our most likes and shares um, in terms of uh, handing out certificates and celebrating prayer of the week we follow safeguarding rules so we don't publish full names we make sure they've completed the membership form before we start pushing them on uh, social media as well so we've got the consent but that's been a huge success the way we do that as well was we had one whatsapp group which had all the volunteers on it in the football club and it was your worst nightmare your blink and there'd be 94 messages on there relating to the under sevens not putting the goals away properly um so it's just a case of we split that down so we have a mini box whatsapp group we have a youth whatsapp group we have a mini soccer whatsapp group a senior whatsapp group a wildcats um whatsapp group and what happens is on the weekend my phone bings all the time with people uploading pictures celebrating successes team photos people have done well celebrating success and then i simply just upload it on social media so think about what do your customers parents players or coaches want to see and then just market that as best you can and um, if you can move to the next slide please danielle so how you engage with sponsors um there'd be clubs that doesn't do this a lot better than us but i'm going to share you some stuff that we've been doing recently i feel gone are the day of simply going to sponsors and going give us 500 quid we we'll put your name on the front of the shirt and then you won't hear us from us again uh you might get the team photo in the local press who by the way are not really interested in promoting sponsors it needs to be bigger and better than that the world has moved on from me i feel you might get the odd sponsor that doesn't want anything in return but i think social media op opens a whole new world to what you can offer them so if you see on the far side there you've got a little infographic which talks about how many registered members how many teams we've got volunteers so that goes out on all social medias it showcases look what are you going to get is if you use us and our post there you will see it talks about look promotion on social media engages with customers increased sales and there might be tax breaks for you as well if you can write it off in terms of marketing uh, businesses should know their way around that so we're really speaking to local businesses and saying look use us use our social media to push whatever product you want and that's free of charge for us we all we're doing is putting up our time to load up an image and that leads us in you will see that car there um the sports car i'm not very good with cars so apologies i don't know what it is but you will see it's got a sponsor on it and um, every with east uh southeast coach works and se signs every monday and thursday uh the director there emails me a quote and emails me a picture all i simply do as long as it's okay and i'm happy with it i just upload it so for a monthly fee that they pay us they do the work i just do the copy and pasting so there's different ways so get the sponsors to work for with you and you might be able to really sell what you're doing as a club and help them along the way another example there is an estate agent so we've agreed a referral fee with them for every time a house gets sold through them and the person's uh, buying the house or selling the house uh reference faversham strike force um you can um we get 150 pound off of that so th so there's a real example of that um and how that can work with you so they're not giving us any upfront fees without making money themselves so it's in their interest to use us because we're pushing their message um in terms of um the one with the pretty sweet parcels we've been doing online challenges uh over the covid period trying to in encourage players to stay active we've been challenging them the last couple of weeks through coif terms or anything like that in return they update upload the video we share it and celebrate their success a company reached out to us who do sweet parcels so they go out they deliver um parcels of sweets simple as that um so if kids can't go to the shop they're delivering them there which is great because it means that um kids are getting absolutely hyped on sugar while being locked in the house which is great for parents i assume um but what that company's doing is they're giving us a prize which then raises the profile of the competition which then means more parents engage with us which then means it shows that we are still active through covid and in return 
they're just simply getting loads of more orders of sweet parcels. Thank you, Danielle. Uh, in terms of, we've had loads of success recruiting new volunteers. So um, if you will see on the one which talks about, is your son or daughter looking for a career in sport? So this is about engaging with young volunteers. We've had so much success through this, we've stopped advertising for young volunteers because we can't take any more young volunteers. We're maxed out in terms of what we can offer them in terms of um, their roles and responsibilities. So every team has got three or four coaches now, including a young volunteer. The way we've sold it, you will see there that any volunteer that joins us, once their DBS is done, we kit them out in roughly about £130 worth of night gear and we fully fund their level one or level two and their DBS. So you may be thinking, well, how do you do that financially? Well, we make it work for us. But we've had our greatest growth and retention in volunteers ever because we're investing in them. We're investing £300 straight off the bat fully funding courses, doing the night gear. Now you might be thinking that we're charging a fortune, we're not, we have a 20 pound signing on fee every year at the start of the season and uh, people pay 14 pound a month. So I think we're quite reasonable for getting four training sessions on the 3G, four matches, etc., and you're getting a fully qualified coaches. But we believe that's a real success for us because we're making that volunteer immediately feel part of it, a part of our community. We're kitting them out. We're making them look like they're part of the club. They're one of us. And like I said, we've had the greatest growth in retention. And when we talk about volunteers, we talk about them developing the softer skills. So developing confidence, being part of the community uh, and making new friends. So you'll see that picture of Lee and Gary looking happy. We use that when we're talking about new volunteers. We use images like that because we want people to buy into the fact that it is a fun, friendly place and you will learn as a volunteer as well. When we're learning about um, coaching roles and so not young volunteers and treasurers, for example, and committee places, we talk about how much time they're going to give as well. So we mark it that you're going to give one or two hours to, um, to the session. So volunteers know straight off the bat how much time they're going to give and what they're going to get in return. You will see on the right hand side that, as you know, referees are hard to come by in Kent and, and many, many areas. We have to appoint our referees, apart from senior leagues and county-wide youth leagues, we appoint our own referees. As we get bigger and we get more teams, we need more referees. So if you look at the unique selling point there is, I've put myself in the shoes of a referee. I'm not a referee, but I'm thinking, what would get me to referee at Fowish and Strifles? One, are my fees paid? What am I going to get? Am I going to get paid like every other club? Yes. Is it a safe and supportive environment, i.e., are there going to be coaches and parents who shouting at me? We're saying no, it's a safe and supportive environment. And regular access to games. So if I'm a referee and I can be offered a game on a Saturday morning, Saturday afternoon, Sunday morning, Sunday afternoon by Faversham Strike Force coaches, then I'm probably going to stay around and I'm probably going to be more interested in Faversham Strike Force rather than refereeing in another club. Thank you, Danielle. So uh, connection through COVID. So here's some of the elements that we've used um, through the COVID situation. I was really fearful that the drop off in training and matches was going to put a halt or a pause on our social media. And then people start on following, start on liking, and then we're back to, to scratch. But actually, we probably had the most engagement. And naively, from my point of view, that's probably because more people are on their phone they're probably at home and they're probably wanting to connect with more people at this time. Um, so we showcased that if you see, it looks like um, we're doing a uh, COVID-19 prison chat, but that's our actual committee you will see in the top corner. Um, so we've showcased on social media, actually the committee is still meeting. We're still making sure that we're working as hard as we can to make the club as best as possible. Uh, we're registering, we're encouraging parents who are in year R, whose daughter, son or daughter a year, are in year one in September to register their interest. So when we get back, we can make contact. We've branded our videos online, our challenges, our fitness sessions. Uh, we've called them the practice zone. We've tried to reiterate messages around supporting the NHS to stay at home and, and stay connected. 
We've had fun with uh, images of coaches. We've covered them with face masks and people have to guess who the coaches is. We've spoke to every team and under, understood where they might need an experienced coach. So you will see the under 14s help wanted. We're still encouraging uh, parents with daughters to register their interest around our Wildcats, which we've now branded Girls Just Want to Have Fun. And we talk about their girls football sessions every Sunday. One of our main concerns was around, uh, we collect our subs through Go Cardless, which is direct debit system. So on the second of every month, we get our income for every month um, through parent subscriptions. We were worried that everyone was going to cancel their direct debit. Then when we went back at being active, actually, um, we weren't going to have any income coming through because everyone has to re-sign up and people might not want to come back straight away. So we froze our um, payments. So we said to everyone, don't cancel. We're going to freeze them. No one's going to get charged. Just do not cancel them so we can unpause them when we're ready to get back. We've had four cancel out of 450 odd. Um, and one of them was by accident and three of them are senior players. So they might not be coming back next year or for whatever reason. So we can deal with four people canceling their direct debit we couldn't deal with over 400 counselling. So that's why we promoted the possibility of freezing. And as Charlotte already said, word of mouth is the greatest tool for grassroots football. So getting parents to recommend your football club to another parent is more powerful than anything we're going to show you. So if you can get them to do recommendations and tag people in when you're promoting, it's the biggest tool you can use. Think about when someone has recommended something to you. If you trust that person and you believe in them and you believe what they're they're telling you is true, you go with it. You go and buy from that shop with doing very little checks. If they tell you a school's good or there's a massive sign outside saying Ofsted said we are excellent, then generally you, you go off people's recommendations. You might do a little bit more digging, but generally that... That one is the golden thread between them joining your club. Thank you, Danielle. So some of our hacks. So if you're uh, super good on Photoshop or anything like that, then uh, you can put your fingers in your ears because you might not want to hear this or how I do stuff because you will do it so much better. But I use Hootsuite. So Hootsuite is um, a scheduling tool. You can register for free, but if you want to schedule uh, over a certain amount of posts, then you need to pay for it. They do offer a um, discount um, uh, in terms of if you're a non-for-profit organization, you just need to message them. I think it comes down to just, uh, I think it's £99 from £199. So that's a really good, you can schedule your uh, your month's worth of messages. So for example, I know for the next month, I need to push uh, interest in our mini bolts. So every day at a certain time throughout a month, Hootsuite will send out a message for me. So I don't need to worry about promoting mini bolts for the next month because it's gonna go out. Also Hootsuite, you can get an app on your phone as well as uh, the desktop. And you can go on there, and as long as you've registered your social media account, so for us, Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram, you can go on there, upload your photo, upload your text, press click, and it posts to all three um, accounts. So you don't have to go into Facebook to do a post, into Instagram to do a post, and then into Twitter to do a post. It just does all three at once. So when we do Player of the Week, for example, I haven't got to go into every individual little Johnny's photo with him being Player of the Week just gets put out once. I also use Movie Maker. I'm not sure if you can download this anymore, but I'm sure it's available somewhere. Um, It's the most simple editing tool for video you'll ever come across. You can cut videos, you can put titles over the top, you can put sound over the top. It is so simple uh, using that. All the images that you see that I've done through this, so if you you look to the COVID stuff around the mini bowls, everything like that, Everything I've done has been designed through PowerPoint. So you can do your slides through PowerPoint, your images through PowerPoint, and go to save as, and you save it as a JPEG, JPEG or whatever you want to save it as, and it saves it as an image, which you can obviously upload online. Uh, you can save it if you're good at um, doing PowerPoints that roll through, so animation on it. You can save that as um, 
an MP4. So you can save it as a video and then upload that. So you don't need all this fancy equipment. The fancy equipment helps it make makes it look a lot better. But if you're looking for some cheap hacks, the only one that costs is Hootsuite, and they do that as a regular price. I would say if I didn't have Hootsuite, I probably wouldn't be doing this role at the club because it alleviates every um, day to day remembering to put something out on social media. It does it for me. It just takes half hour at the start or the end of every month. My biggest tip is coming back to them three points, create a real community feel, fun, friendly learning works for us, what works for you, what's your motto, what do you want people to know about when they first think of your football club, what do you want them to think about? Understand what's going on, so you might not want to be part of all the WhatsApp groups like I am and hear about coaches moaning, but actually it's the greatest tool. What is going on in your club? How can you put it out? And it's great for, so for example, I we've got three under sevens teams. Two of them were brilliant at sending me stuff on face for, to put on social media. One wasn't. Who piped up? The parents of that team. So then, then parents went to that manager and said, look, we want our son or daughter's pictures going out like the other teams. What's going on? He now brings that into us. So all three under seven teams are getting promoted. Internal help, I've already talked about through your online data caption. What does that look like for you? What do you ask people when they're filling their membership? Ask them what trade they do. You might fill other roles as well, like an accountant, uh, tradesman around, everything else. But you might find that people are there to do the marketing. They might have an expert. You might be so lucky to get a Charlotte or people like that who might be just in and around the club who might be willing to do this. External help is a huge win for me and the football club. Uh, two good examples I've got is I saw some imagery on Twitter, some designs. Loved it. Said to the designer, I love your work. We're a local football club. How much to do them designs for us? He come back to me and went, Lee, I'm doing for nothing for you. I've not got much work on at the moment. All I ask is you uh, credit us afterwards. So if you go on our Twitter afterwards, you will see um, we've promoted. I wouldn't start badging him for free work for your football club because he's going to tag on that I'll put you his way but you might look at his stuff and be inspired to reach out to other people and um, the other external help we've got is I linked up with a local university so sports science students are key so we've managed to get sports science student students in year two who have to do a hundred year hundred hours placement they've now come to us and do volunteering we kit them up we pay for their mileage etc but in terms of social media for the last five years I've worked with the media and communications department at the University of Christchurch in Canterbury. Every year, because the lecturer likes us as a football club and is willing to help, we get three uh, groups of four students who do their end of university project with us. So we set them a theme. It might be recruit more girls, more volunteers, get more sponsors. We set them that. They then have to go and work on a marketing campaign for us. Now, we've had some really rubbish uh, groups, I'm not going to lie to you, who have produced not great projects for us. We've had some who have been excellent, who we still use their imagery, who we still use their videos and their campaign messages. Uh, we use hashtag fill the force, which was one of their ideas. We use that. But at the very least, at the end of the course, we get a USB. Part of the terms and conditions of us working in the university is that every student group has to provide us with a memory stick which has all the images and videos on it. So they come down, they, took, they take thousands of photos that we've not now got. We haven't had to do anything. We haven't had to pay anyone. We haven't had to pay a photographer. They've come to us. So definitely reach out to your local colleges or universities and build up a relationship with them. Thank you, Danielle. And the last one for me is very much on what Charlotte said. Look, have a go. As long as you're following the FA guidance around uh, safeguarding GDPR and you're doing your best, you're a have a go hero, just give it your best shot. Look, I'm forever misspelling stuff. I am forever putting the wrong name to the wrong kid's photo because I had a guess of the kid's name because I thought it was right. I didn't read the 
posted a message. What's the worst I could do? Well, on Twitter, you can't edit it, so delete it and do it again. Instagram and Facebook, go on there, click the three dots and edit it. Someone will always pick it up to you. What's the worst that can happen? And just have a strategy about it. As long as you're trying the best thing and working and trying your best, no one can ever fault that or, or have a go at you. Just have a go at it because I love doing it. I love the power of social media. I love social marketing. I love the um, the effect it has, how you can influence people on a match day to not shout at the kids, for example. We have a message that goes out every Saturday morning to not be an idiot on the, so on the sideline in so many words. Use those messages, get them out, have a go. I think you'll really enjoy it. Um, and hopefully you found this success tonight and you've picked up stuff. Uh, do not hesitate to contact me on social media. Um, do not hesitate to um, drop me an email and um, I will help you out as best I can. Brilliant. Thank you so much, Lee. And I think everyone tuned in this evening will have taken so much away from that and your honesty as well about your approach. And I think it's um, lovely to see everyone responding and already thinking about your values and really already going away with some ideas about how marketing can bring these to life. And even sometimes in the presentation, it feels like I'm using a lot of marketing terminology. So to have our guests on to showcase what that looks like. So even the example of target markets, the work that Lee did there was to create in a brand for mini bolts to attract young players to strike force and um, absolutely outstanding. So obviously the aim of this WebEx was to, to show you how to look at marketing and how it can support growth and it can sustain, ugh, sustain participation. Um, and hopefully you found that exploration of different ways and methods really helpful and been able to take away some ideas of how these can be applied, whether you're a team with aspirations to become charter standard or you're a well-established league looking to expand your offer into a different part of the game. And it goes without saying, of course, that now is a challenging time for our game. There are going to be some hurdles, but there is so much opportunity too. And perhaps this time can prove useful in setting up a future that inspires you in the same way that the work that Lee does clearly and inspires and passionately drives his work and your local football family as well. So the one key takeaway is that marketing is a positive, empowering tool, one that if you embed into your planning and organisation can be harnessed to galvanise your whole club and league's development plans. And like I say, I think Lee has really spelled out the benefits, showing how a sustained commitment to trying to get your marketing right, being engaged with an online community and making sure that communicating is a priority brings an untold amount of benefits. And most of those benefits are tangible as you've seen Strike Force and the number of players and teams increasing, the number of sponsors recruited, but some of them won't be tangible. Some of them are gonna be long-term beneficial impacts um, that you will see, and some of them will be slightly more discreet. So we have got one more webinar next week, and that's all around how we can use marketing to generate income. Obviously, income generation is supremely important for all football organisations. And we've placed that as the last one in our series because we think the webinar will be especially powerful and constructive. Now we've established what marketing tools can be used best, how they can be used strategically, and ways you can use them in your club infrastructure. And I'm conscious we've, um, we've taken up a lot of your time this evening, but Lee and I are around to answer some questions, Danielle, if any of them have come up. Thanks, Charlotte. Um, I'm just having a look at the chat now. We've, we've had a few come in, which is brilliant, and, and thank you ever so much for your engagement. Um, there's some some real great praises for yourself, Charlotte and Lee, for your content. So great work to you guys both, first and foremost. So just a couple of questions, um, and happy for maybe Charlotte used to take the lead and, and um, Lee jump in, kind of to support if possible. So Simon's asked a really good question. Um, around tweet deck charlotte um and just asking if two or more people uh can use use it or is it just kind of specific for for one individual yeah so that's a really good question and it was something we covered in the social media webinar last week so do check it out because um it's really fantastic because 
multiple people can use it. So what you'll do as a club or league or whatever football organisation you're from is you will you will set up an account for your specific organisation. So you'll have a username and password and then you'll be able to control who has access to that because you'll be able to give them the password to log in. So for example, if you spent some time um, scheduling some messages on um, that platform and then someone else logs in, they can see everything that you've mapped out so you won't replicate each other's work you'll see everything that's kind of going on. So it's really, really good in terms of um, if you're trying to build a team of volunteers, it helps spread that workload out. And as Lee's um, demonstrated in his slides as well, how much time it saves you. Um, you don't have to be in a position where you have to pick between being consistent and actually having a bit of a life outside of football as well. So I'd really recommend everyone goes in and, and has a look at those different platforms and, and do take a look at that social media webinar because some other platforms, other scheduling tools that we introduce you to. Brilliant, thanks Charlotte. And just a reminder for those that are on the call that didn't catch the email address, it is program at the fa.com. So um, if you have missed the social media webinar or any of the others, please do drop me an email and I can share them um, directly to yourself. So next question, Charlotte, is coming um, all around really how powerful is the hashtag on social media? We've also spoken around um, it, this evening and on, on previous webinars um, and if, if you uh, follow accounts like I do on Instagram they pop up left right and centre so how powerful really is that is the hashtag? Again a really good question and one we dedicated a couple of slides to in social media because hashtags are a good they're good in many senses so you can use hashtags for engaging and, and trying to cultivate yourself some space um, in online conversations you want to be a part of. So if we take Fabrician Strike Force, for example, say Lee was looking to set up that Wildcat Centre, he could use hashtags such as Fabrician, girls, football, local, and, and using those hashtags mean that the posts that Fabrician Strike Force share will engage with audiences. So if someone in the Fabrician area is looking at the hashtag girls football it will come up um, come apart so it really helps in terms of boosting your reach so basically putting your posts in front of people you might not be able to normally attract so you have hashtag usage in that sense and then you have what i like to call strategic hashtags so the example um i think with strike force they have unleashed the force so what this is really good at is it's a branding exercise so your hashtag I think I could possibly align it to maybe if your club has a nickname or you as an organisation have a sort of um, motto, it tends to be really useful. Something um, that we did at Margate is we, when I came in as a marketeer, the club had been for a really rotten time both on and off the pitch, they'd been relegated, there was a real fracture between them and the local community, no one really wanted to touch the football club, it had a lot of work to do on its PR. So we created the hashtag in this together and we would use that to sort of theme our content so everything we pushed out on social media would have that hashtag. So it was really good in terms of unifying our content so anyone that looked up that hashtag we took a lot of ownership over it. Secondly we encouraged our stakeholders to use it as well so when we could we'd encourage the players to use that hashtag and certainly supporters um, we would encourage them if they were coming to games to share the content etc and we also actually had it plastered on the main stand of our stadium because it really really summed up our values at the time which was to identify as a club that was community driven that wanted to be seen as a real driving force not only on the pitch but off of it and it's proven really successful over those three seasons we changed it when we had the link with the libertines and we changed it to hashtag time for heroes which is um, a name of their one of their songs and it worked really well obviously the idea being that if your striker gets a 90th minute winner it kind of lended itself really nicely to content but also every time we sent out a shirt because as I was saying the shirt sales went crazy we put a little card in and asked um, our customers to upload a photo using that hashtag so if they didn't tag the football club directly I could search that hashtag and see this wealth of content what we like to call user generated content and user generated content is brilliant because you don't have to do the hard work as you saw on some of the slides earlier brilliant engaging images that we can utilize and and repurpose 
So hashtags are really useful and, and they give a way of other people being able to engage with you as a brand. And that dialogue is so important if you want to see growth in social media. Brilliant. Thanks, Charlotte. And we've got a live example in the chat. I don't know if you can see it, but um, Koval joined us, us last week um, around the social media webinar and have since implemented we are Covil hashtag which has been getting some good traction on social media so great work guys in terms of implementing uh, some of the top tips charlotte shared last week um, and the same with um, afc oldham their hashtag is team afco um, so again another good live example coming in from yourself this evening around how powerful hashtags can be so simon hopefully that answers your question around hashtags. Um, Lee, one did come in for you, um, which is fantastic. And it was all actually around um, how many female volunteers you have within the club. And then I'd probably just like to add from that. So that's a question from David um, around kind of how many vol female volunteers you do have. And I just wonder if there was a specific marketing tool that you have maybe used or a different type of messaging to attract female volunteers to your club. Thanks, Danielle. Thanks, David, for the question. Really good. Um, so when we were starting our wildcat session, we were really focused on having a female base of coaches. So we've got uh, 14 female coaches all in all throughout the club. And then we've got uh, female representation on the committee in terms of other roles, uh, treasurer, uh, couple of fixture secretaries and uh, the main general secretary. So we do uh, cover in terms of female volunteers. In terms of when we're recruiting female volunteers, uh, we work on the basis very similar to the young coaches. So about uh, expanding your knowledge of the game, um, kit and equipment, becoming a qualified coach, but also um, we sell the point of them about inspiring the next generation of girls. So I think if I'm a uh, female who's in football, who enjoys playing football, and I want to work with and make sure there's all these wonderful generations of girls coming through, then let's tap into that. Because if I can tap into someone's passion for football and getting more young girls uh, active, then let's use that as one of our key messages. Brilliant. Thanks, Lee. David, hopefully that answered your question um, with, sorry, just a little bit of a, a spin in and around kind of social media and marketing from myself there. Brilliant. Thanks, Charlotte. Thanks, Lee. That looks like just the, the end of the questions in the chat. So thank you very much, everyone, for your interaction this evening. Just want to remind you, I think Charlotte and Lee have, have covered it um, exceptionally well this evening, but please do make sure you check out our social media guidances which can be found on the fa.com forward slash safeguarding, just to make sure that everything you're doing is in line um, and is um, kind of in accordance with, with the guidance. Our next webinar, as Charlotte has quite rightly referred to, is the last of our series. So it will be um, a huge shame not to have Charlotte supporting future webinars, but she's done an amazing job. And the last one is all around how can we use marketing to generate income? The link will be sent to you um, before the weekend, along with the content this evening. That just leaves me to say thank you very much for your time. Charlotte Lee, again, thank you for being a fantastic guest this evening. Um, I wish you all a great long weekend for those that are fortunate enough to um, be able to enjoy the weekend. Hopefully the sun remains and we'll look forward to seeing you all next week. Thank you very much. Thank you for tuning in to the FA Football Forum. If you like this episode and you want any more information, please visit thefa.com forward slash clubs and leagues or email clubsprogram at thefa.com. If you want a monthly dose of this content, be sure to search the Grassroots Football Hub on YouTube or find In The Box on your favourite podcast provider. This is the podcast supporting grassroots clubs and leagues be the best places to play and enjoy the game.